I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's May 3rd, and we have a lot to talk about. In last week's episode of the podcast, we focused on a recently published study that was commissioned by the National MS Society that showed the annual economic burden of MS in the United States comes out to $85.4 billion. Keep in mind, that's an annual economic burden. And while that demonstrates the outrageous aggregate cost of MS across the United States— There's also a much more personal, much more individual economic burden of living with MS. Planning your financial future is good advice for everyone. But if you're living with MS, it's more than just good advice. It's an important part of the game plan for living your best life. And joining me to talk about how you want to go about planning your financial future and the things you want to be thinking about if you're living with MS is Dick Bell, a professional financial advisor who's worked with over 600 clients who are living with MS. But before we get to my conversation with financial advisor Dick Bell, there are a few other things that you should know about. As we're all too aware, there's a terrible war being waged in Eastern Europe between Russia and Ukraine. But you may not be aware of how this war is impacting clinical research, including MS research. Looking at Ukraine alone, it's estimated that the pharmaceutical industry is currently conducting 502 different clinical trials. And that number represents all clinical trials, not just the clinical trials that are focused on multiple sclerosis. The pharmaceutical industry likes conducting clinical trials in Russia, Ukraine, and the surrounding countries because there's a high level of academic expertise available to manage and carry out the trials themselves. The costs of clinical trials in these countries is relatively low compared to other regions of the world. And perhaps most importantly, Recruiting participants for clinical trials is easier in these countries because people tend to believe that they'll receive better care in a clinical trial than they would through their country's healthcare system. Roche, the manufacturer of Ocrevus, is currently conducting global clinical trials for a potential MS treatment called fenabrutinib. And about 20 to 30 percent of the participants in these trials are located in Russia and Ukraine. Last week, Roche warned that Russia's attack on Ukraine was disrupting their work on fenabrutinib. Now, like most pharmaceutical companies, Roche has stopped all recruiting for clinical trials in Russia and is opening or expanding the clinical trial sites in Poland, Slovakia, and Romania in the hopes that they can take on the trial participants from Ukraine. When you're first diagnosed with MS, you quickly learn that MS is a demyelinating disease. It destroys the myelin sheath that surrounds the nerve fibers in the central nervous system, and that causes communication breakdown between these nerve fibers. And that breakdown in smooth communications is what causes MS symptoms to develop. There are 20-plus MS medications available today, And while there's plenty of evidence to demonstrate that these medications are effective at slowing disability progression, none of them repair the myelin that's already been lost to MS. And repairing that myelin can lead to restoring lost function. Just a couple of weeks ago, I told you that the FDA had approved a clinical trial for an investigational treatment designed to repair myelin. And I mentioned that other studies focused on myelin repair are or soon will be taking place. So today I can tell you about a trial taking place in the UK that will look at whether a combination of an antihistamine called clemestine and a diabetes medication called metformin might promote myelin repair in people living with relapsing remitting MS. The trial is going to enroll 50 adults between the ages of 25 and 50 who are living with relapsing remitting MS and are on stable treatment with an MS medication. 
Now, this trial itself came about as a result of a previous study that tested clemestine in addition to MS medications in 50 adults living with MS who showed chronic damage to the optic nerve, which is responsible for transmitting signals from the eye to the brain. Now, the results of that study showed that the clemestine treatment accelerated the speed of those signals from the optic nerve to the brain, And this effect continued for two months after treatment had been stopped. Now, since functional intact myelin is necessary to transmit those signals from the optic nerve to the brain, the study's investigators surmised that this treatment promoted myelin repair. But you may be wondering, why combine clemestine with the diabetes drug metformin? Well, previous animal studies have shown that metformin might actually enhance the effects of clemestine, but this combination has never been tested in humans before, so this will be an interesting study to watch. This clinical trial has just recruited its very first participant, so there aren't any results to review. But if you'd like to review some of the details of the study itself, you'll find a link in today's show notes. We often talk about biomarkers on this podcast, and as a quick review, a biomarker is a characteristic that can be objectively measured and evaluated as an indicator of normal or abnormal biological processes. Things like your pulse, blood pressure, and cholesterol level are all examples of biomarkers. Biomarkers can indicate the status of a specific process taking place in our bodies, And there are biomarkers that can predict things that are likely going to occur. And an analysis of data from two large clinical trials for key symptom indicate that the levels of a protein found in nerve cell projections, a protein called neurofilament light chain, can help predict disease progression in people living with relapsing remitting MS. The researchers who performed this analysis also indicated that neurofilament light chain levels could also predict brain lesions seen in MRI exams and brain volume loss. We've talked about neurofilament light chain, or NFL, in previous podcast episodes, as scientists are finding ways to correlate different levels of NFL to MS disease activity. The only time that NFL is released into the blood is when nerve cells are damaged. People living with MS show raised NFL levels. And in this study, the research team wanted to learn whether measuring NFL levels could help identify people with MS who were at higher risk for future disease activity. If that sort of predictive analysis was possible, a neurologist might be inclined to employ a more aggressive treatment approach before any worsening had ever taken place. The research team analyzed data that was available from the two Phase three clinical trials for key symptom. These trials were completed just a couple of years ago in 2020, and this analysis looked at the relationship between NFL levels at the start of the trials and the disease progression that took place over the next two and a half years. The results of the analysis showed that trial participants with high NFL levels at the start of the clinical trial, showed a greater accumulation of new and enlarging brain lesions. And this was true even among those trial participants who showed no evidence of disease activity at the start of the trial. The research team also observed that the trial participants with high NFL levels lost more brain volume than those trial participants with low NFL levels, And the greatest difference in brain volume loss was most evident in the part of the brain called the thalamus, an area of the brain that other studies have associated with MS progression and cognitive impairment. The results of this study take us another step closer to seeing neurofilament light chain levels used in both research and clinical settings. That could potentially lead to neurologists and research scientists being better able to predict disease progression response to a specific MS medication, and what the quality of life might be for someone living with MS in the not-too-distant future. If you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find a link in today's show notes.
This seems to be the most appropriate follow-up to the news about neurofilament light chain being shown to be a reliable predictor of future MS progression. The FDA has granted breakthrough device designation to a neurofilament light chain test from Quadrix, a company whose focus is digitizing biomarker analysis. Quadrix's NFL analysis technology was cited in more than 20 different studies that were just presented at the recent American Academy of Neurology conference. And to quote directly from the FDA, breakthrough device designation is granted to novel medical devices that have the potential to provide more effective treatment or diagnosis of life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating diseases or conditions. To put this designation into perspective, last year the FDA granted breakthrough device designation to a total of 213 medical devices. The ability to determine whether someone is responding well to a new MS medication or the ability to predict future disease progression from a simple blood test is a true game changer. And that makes this very good news. The MS Trust is a relatively small but important nonprofit organization in the UK that was started in 1993 by two women, one of whom lived with MS and the other had lost her mother and her mother's sister to MS. Visit their website and you'll read that the MS Trust is committed to ensuring everyone with MS can access the treatments and services they need and deserve. And to that end, the MS Trust spends more than $750,000 a year providing funding to MS health professionals and another $300,000 providing training and support to MS health professionals. They also spend over $650,000 annually on providing information to people affected by MS. And last week, the MS Trust released the results of an online survey they conducted from February 11th through March 7th of this year. 718 people living with MS completed the survey. Most were women between the ages of 30 and 60 who were living in England and had been diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS. The survey results showed that 95% of the survey respondents felt that MS had changed their lives. 43% of the survey respondents said that MS interfered with their ability to complete daily tasks like eating or dressing. And 40% of the respondents said that MS interfered with their ability to live independently. 96% of the survey respondents indicated that they suffered from MS-related fatigue, 93% experienced balance issues, and 86% reported having concentration and memory problems. When it came to their mental health, 87% of the survey respondents experienced anxiety, 81% had mood swings, and 78% experienced depression. Nine out of ten survey respondents indicated that MS had affected their self-esteem, and almost 30% of the respondents reported having suicidal thoughts. 88% of the survey respondents indicated that MS had affected their work and career, with just over a third of the respondents reported that they actually had to stop working. 70% of the survey respondents reported that MS had affected their overall financial status, and about 75% of the respondents reported that MS had affected their relationships with loved ones and friends. This paints a pretty somber picture of what it's like to live with MS. That challenge in virtually every area of life is something I never lose sight of. But the other thing that I try very hard to also keep in mind is the incredible resilience that I've seen demonstrated by so many people who are living with MS. And that side of living with MS was also evident in the MS Trust survey results, with almost 75% of the survey respondents reporting having developed a greater appreciation of the positive aspects of their lives, with some of them having taken up new hobbies, developed new interests, and even made new friends as a result of having MS. MS isn't easy. It will likely impose changes to your life. 
but that doesn't mean you can't rise above MS and develop deep connections with the people in your life. It doesn't mean you can't find new ways to explore the world. It doesn't mean you can't find joy in the things you do. And all of that seems to add up to a life well lived. Now, one thing about living with MS that can negatively impact your quality of life is not being financially prepared for it. And the good news is that there are financial planning steps you can take today that will lay the groundwork for a more positive, less worrisome future down the road. Joining me in a moment to talk about those steps is my guest, Dick Bell. It's never too soon to begin planning for the future. I think that's true for everyone. But financial planning, evaluating your income, your assets, your debts, benefits, and other resources, well, that becomes especially important when it comes to being well-prepared for a future living with MS. Joining me today to discuss financial planning for people living with MS is Dick Bell. Dick is a financial advisor in Calabasas, California, who has worked with over 600 clients with MS. Welcome to the podcast, Dick. Pleasure being with you, John. Thank you. Maybe you can start us off by explaining what financial planning is and, and why it's so important. Well, financial planning is really managing your money uh, to get the most value in your unique circumstances. It's like bringing the future forward to the present and determining what changes do I need to make to get to where I want to be? I, I liken it to having a financial roadmap. If we're going on a trip today, a driving trip, uh, we could go to AAA and get a trip tick. We could go on Google Maps or Waze and put in our destination. But the other part of the equation uh, on the trip is, what's the you are here position? What's your starting point? For most people, it's starting from their home. In financial planning, people have a starting point, but they don't really know what it is. So getting a more accurate you are here position is pretty important for folks to have a listing of their assets. What do I have uh, assets and their liabilities? What do I own and what do I owe? My bank accounts, my retirement accounts, my house, my mortgage, uh, my debts, school loan, car loan, uh, et cetera. And then also uh, understanding what their sources of income are. Living with MS requires a slightly different way of thinking about money and certainly a different way for planning for your future. What additional factors do people with MS have to take into consideration when planning their finances? Yeah, I get this question a lot. The, uh, because folks with MS realize that they're probably not going to have a normal working expectancy like others. They're probably not going to work to a full normal retirement age. So they, they have to do better with their money as they're earning it. And secondly, they realize they're going to need more medical care down the line. They have to have good health insurance um, and be able to maintain that all along. What are some practical approaches then for people to use so they can get their finances in better order? Well, certainly the, the starting point of knowing where they are um, with the you are here position, but they also should look at their uh, spending and saving pattern right now. Look at your bank account, uh, your checking accounts, look at your cards for the last two months. Where did your money go? And that's really the, uh, the concept of budgeting. Where, where am I spending money now? And how, how should I prepare for spending it in the future? If you knew that you had a $6,000 property tax bill due in December, when would be the right time to be starting to, uh, to set money aside for that? October? No, if you did it the prior January and set aside $500 a month, you'd be arriving uh, right in time to, with, the, with the money to pay the bill. I think the challenges people have is they are paying today's bills with tomorrow's dollars rather than paying tomorrow's bills with today's dollars. You know, as you mentioned a moment ago, the majority of people living with MS end up leaving the workforce early, usually within 10 years of getting their diagnosis. So what can someone do to best prepare themselves in the event they can't continue working as far into the future as they might otherwise like? The, the real concern here is the loss of earned income. And they should really understand their employee benefits at work. And ideally, they have group long-term, short-term, but more importantly, long-term disability insurance. 
And they need to understand how that works. And if they were changing jobs, I would really be looking for a job with long-term disability insurance. What are some of the important things that people should look for when they're reviewing their company's group disability benefit? Well, I think the main questions people have is, well, the questions are, uh, how much am I going to get? When's it going to start? How long is it going to go? Uh, typically, it's going to, you would get 60% of pay. It would start after perhaps 30 days of disability. Long-term disability is typically a six-month waiting period, but you might have short-term disability that kicked in before that. And how long are benefits payable? Typically, they'll be payable to age 65 or to Social Security normal retirement age. But then they'll also want to go into their employee benefit handbook and look at what is the definition of disability. It's probably the inability to do the duties of your occupation for the first two years after that to be gainfully employed. And for folks with this with MS, they are likely not to be able to work an eight-hour day. They are just going to poop out earlier in the, uh, in the afternoon. And that leads to the disability. The question is, do we have a partial disability or a long-term disability benefit? You know, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, we know that health insurance policies are required to cover pre-existing conditions like MS. But what about that disability insurance? Are pre-existing conditions covered? Uh, they are after a certain time period. If I join a new group insurance plan today, new employer, and I have MS, and they have a group disability plan, I will not be covered under that plan for MS, being disabled, disabled by MS for the first year. But after that, I will be. And most folks who are working are not going to be disabled from MS the first year. So um, all you have to do is be under the group plan for a year in most cases, and your pre-existing conditions are covered. If someone is covered by their employer's group health insurance plan and they're forced to stop working due to disability, what happens to that health insurance? What do they need to do to make sure that they're covered somehow? Well, they first have to see what the employer is going to do. Often an employer, if you're disabled, is going to continue on the health insurance for a certain length of time. It may be, it may be for six months. It may be for a year. Eventually, the employer wants to get you off that, uh, off their, the cost of health insurance. Cost of health insurance for an employer is normally the second highest cost they have behind payroll. So somebody who is going to lose that coverage has the opportunity to, to buy COBRA coverage, the same coverage for up to 18 months. It could be up to 29 months if, you are, uh, if you're disabled at the time you elect COBRA. Of course, somebody could also buy individual health insurance. Again, with Obamacare, they, uh, all the states have plans that you can get. You're guaranteed to get it, and you're guar it's guaranteed to cover your pre-existing conditions. And what about... SSDI, or Social Security Disability Insurance, who qualifies, how much do they receive, and how long will they receive it? They can find out their benefit by going to ssa.gov and going to the disability section there. The, uh, the, the statement that we get annually or is available to us annually will show us how much we're going to get if we're disabled, and it'll be payable to our social security normal retirement age, which is age 67 for most folks now. Uh, it's going to be a higher percentage of pay replacement for lower paid individuals. Uh, social security provides a very high, like a 90% disability pay, uh, payment for, for lower paid individuals. For others, it's going to be uh, significantly less. I think the, the, the trick with social security disability is you have to be totally disabled and unable to work. You won't get a benefit for the first five months of disability. Once you receive a benefit, it's payable um, to your Social Security normal retirement age, at which point it becomes a retirement. The money is no longer paid out of the disability pot. It's paid out of the uh, retirement pot at Social Security. How often should someone revisit their long-term financial plan? I think it's an ongoing uh, uh, ongoing process. I have a, I have a financial statement that I've put together and I update it on a quarterly basis. Uh, so if somebody was, was going to start one right now, this would be a good time to start if you've just received your first quarter statements on your 401k or your IRA, your 403b plan at work. Uh, I can track my quarterly statement back to uh, 
September 1990. It's just a big Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it's encouraging in, t- in tougher times to say, hey, I've done pretty well along the way. As you watch your debts get paid down and your retirement funds get bigger, it, it's like keep, it's a scorecard. Um, and why people don't do this is beyond me. Everybody, every successful person I know, financially successful person, has a scorecard. They have a financial statement. They know where they are. Are there financial planners that specialize in working with people who are living with chronic illness like MS? Not really. I, th- I think the, the challenge with financial planners is the number of people who hold themselves out as financial planners are really, they may have a certified financial planner designation, but that's, you know, how do I really get paid? Well, I manage assets for people. Well, a lot of folks with MS don't have manageable assets. If you were to call a stock brokerage firm, a wealth management firm, and that's Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, Raymond James, Edward Jones, uh, Wells Fargo Advisors, et cetera. You say, you know, I've got $50,000 to invest. You can hear a dial tone. They have no time to talk to you. So it's, a, it's difficult finding a financial advisor for anybody uh, who's going to work on, uh, on a fee-based basis that some would, would be willing to pay. So a lot of financial planning really is going to be on a do-it-yourself basis, but there are some, some good sources one can go to, to, uh, to get the guidance on how to do it. Well, in that case, I hope you'll share those sources with us. Where, where can our listeners go to find more information about some of the topics you've touched on today? Well, the first thing I would do is I've talked to an MS navigator and I get a copy of the adapting booklet that the MS Society has. It's a good basic financial planning booklet that will cover many of the things that we've talked about today. To go in more depth on any topic, though, I would, I would Google Dave Ramsey. Um, Dave is a, has a talk show. He's a radio host, financial planning. It's basic financial planning, but that's what most people need. They really don't need investment advice. They need budgeting advice. They need uh, saving advice. They need debt reduction advice. And Ramsey's material is very good on that. I mean, he's got a lot of stuff that he sells. You don't have to buy it, but he's got a lot of um, very good podcasts too. I'm always up for recommending very good podcasts, so thanks for saying that. (laughs) Sure. Financial planning is incredibly important, but as you know better than I, so often overlooked. And if you have a clean bill of health, you have a wider margin for error when it comes to thinking and planning your future. But if you're living with MS or any chronic illness, you absolutely owe it to yourself and your family to develop a financial game plan for the future. Dick Bell, thank you for helping us understand how important that is. And thanks for talking with me today. Always good to be with you, John. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or families know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 244. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or text. And if you have a minute, I hope you'll visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the best way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS You'll be able to access any of our past episodes. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. The app is free, so I hope you'll download it today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.